Chapter 4, Out of the Past As the girls walked slowly to their car, Louise urged Penny to explain her meaning in regard to the witch doll. It's just a feeling I had, said Penny. However, I'll prove to you that the box came from the marble shop. Entering the car, she unwrapped the French doll purchased by Louise only a few moments earlier and disclosed a cream-colored carton with fancy scalloped edges. You're right, Louise acknowledged. It's a dead ringer for the one Miss Harmon received. Still, a number of doll shops may use this type of box. I'd like to think so, Lou, but I can't remember. Well, someone may have bought the doll at her shop. That's possible, agreed Penny, but I doubt if Nellie would make up a doll like that old witch, except as a special order. No, somehow I have a feeling she sent it herself. Why would she do such a thing? She may have thought it really would prove an inspiration for a dance, though in that case it's queer she didn't write a note. Maybe I'll drop around at the shop tomorrow and ask her a few questions. Penny backed the car from the alley and, at Louise's request, drove directly to the Seidel home. She declined an invitation to stay for a belated luncheon. I'm on my way to the star office to meet Dad, she explained. See you tomorrow, Louise. A short ride brought Penny to a large two-story stone building which housed the Riverview Star. Through the massive plate glass window, she could see the giant printing press rolling out the early afternoon edition. Waving carelessly at Joe, the press room foreman, she went into the building, past the advertising department, to the editorial room jammed with desks. Hi, Bright Penny, called Jerry Livingston, court reporter. Penny nodded in a friendly way and paused to scan a paper still fresh with the smell of ink. Tucking it under her arm, she opened the door to the office marked Anthony B. Parker, editor. Hello, Dad, she greeted the lean, slightly gray-haired man who was busy at his desk, working hard as usual. Things have been popping around here today, her father admitted. We had a fire and a big robbery ten minutes before the edition deadline. I was so hard-pressed that I had to send out for luncheon. Just finished it as you stepped in the door. I'll finish what you didn't, laughed Penny, helping herself to a sandwich on the tray on the desk. She took a large bite, made a grimace, and dropped the sandwich as if it were a hot coal. Limburger cheese? Dad, how can you eat that stuff? The other one is ham grinned her father. With your appetite, I should think you could down anything. I didn't have any luncheon myself, Penny explained, cautiously sampling the ham sandwich. Dad, how much would a couple of scoops be worth to you? You didn't run into a good news story by any chance, Mr. Parker inquired. I encountered something interesting, Penny replied seriously. Measured by your standards, it may not be front page, but I think it would make good reading. She gave an account of her visit to Nellie Marble's doll shop and told of the accident which had held to her meeting with Helene Harmon. To Penny's disappointment, her father did not seem greatly impressed. The doll shop story might make a little box feature, he said. We could run a line or so about the accident to Miss Harmon's car, although it may have been a publicity stunt. Oh, it was a genuine accident, Penny insisted. I saw it with my own blue eyes. And that witch doll. No witch doll in the Riverview Star, said Mr. Parker firmly. Oh, all right, Dad, but maybe you'll change your mind later on. There's something queer about Nellie sending Miss Harmon that doll. Mr. Parker had a note of the two stories which his daughter had given him. Penny knew he considered the information of slight consequence, but would run the, the news more to please her than for any other reason. One of these days I'll bring you a story so tremendous you'll have to use headlines a foot high, she threatened. The bigger they come, the better I like it. Penny Fish finished the ham sandwich and then said significantly, Dad, today's Thursday. So it is. 
Your daughter's allowance falls due every Thursday, remember? No chance I'll ever forget was such an expert collector always on my trail, Mr. Parker chuckled. He took a sealed envelope from his desk drawer and gave it to her. Many, many thanks, Dad. Penny stooped over the back of her father's chair, planting a kiss on the top of his head. Remember, this money isn't for me. It's all for the leaping Lena. Pocketing the envelope, she turned towards the door. Tell Mrs. Weems I may be home early for dinner tonight, Mr. Parker said by way of farewell, and thanks for the business call. It was nearly 3.30 before Penny reached home. The Parker residence stood on a pleasant, tree-shaded street in the north section of Riverview, and from the high terrace at the rear of the grounds, one commanded a view of the winding river far below. The lawn was a velvety green, while irregular beds of shrubbery and tall growing flowers gave the yard a charm and privacy. Penny found the house doors locked, but a key had been left under the mat. Mrs. Weems must have gone to the grocery store, she reflected. Unlocking the door, she let herself into the kitchen. As usual, it was spick and span, for Miss Weems was a careful housekeeper. Looking about for a note, which might have been left for her, and finding none, Penny helped herself to a banana from the fruit dish. She then curled herself on the living room davenport and proceeded to read a book. The clock on the fireplace mantel chimed the hour of five as she finished the last page. Goodness, it's getting late, she exclaimed, jumping up. Mrs. Weems isn't home yet. I wonder what can be keeping her. Penny remembered that her father had said that he may be home early that evening. Unless Mrs. Weems arrived soon, there would be no dinner ready. Something must have detained her, she thought. Maybe I should try to get things started. She wandered out into the kitchen and after setting the table, peeled a pan of potatoes and put them on the stove to boil. In the refrigerator, she found the makings for a vegetable salad and Mrs. Weems had baked a chocolate pie before going away. Penny was soberly contemplating the large raw beef roast when she heard the housekeeper step on the front porch. A moment later, Mrs. Weems, flushed and breathless from hurrying, came into the house. Oh, I'm glad you started the dinner, Penny, she said. Dear me, I didn't mean to be so late. I never should have stayed, but that man was so perfectly marvelous. I've never seen anyone like him in all my life. Penny gave the housekeeper a sidelong glance. Usually Mrs. Weems was very placid and calm, and it seemed rather strange to hear her talking so enthusiastically. Who is this perfectly marvelous man, Penny asked, a movie star or a new flame? Penny, Mrs. Weems reproved. You talk as if I were a schoolgirl, and I'm sure I don't know where you learn all those slang words. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Weems. I meant to say, who is this fascinating gentleman who has produced such a volcanic effect in your life? Oh, you have the wrong impression, Penny. The man didn't interest me personally. I'm far too old for such nonsense. But it was marvelous, the things O Sandra revealed to me. O Sandra, repeated Penny. That name sounds familiar. Isn't he a medium? Oh, yes. Melvin O Sandra has an establishment down on Clark Street, a very ornate place. A friend of mine took me to a seance. Penny, will you believe it? I received a message out of the past, a message from a distant cousin of mine who died ten years ago. Don't let Dad hear you say that, Penny warned. You know mediums and the like are sheer poison to him. He would say it was all superstitious rot, Mrs. Weems nodded. To tell you the truth, I didn't take any stock in such things myself until today, but this man, oh Sandra, is remarkable. What message did he bring you? asked Penny, trying not to smile too broadly. We all sat at a large round table holding hands. Then the lights went out. Osander went into a trance. He began to shake and moan, and then suddenly a voice cried, Maud, Maud. 
That was my name, of course. I was so startled I nearly fell out of my chair. And then what happened? The voice went on. This is Fred. Fred. I thought right away, it must be my cousin Fred Palman, because I never knew any other person by that name, and at least no one who had passed on. You and your cousin had been well acquainted? Well, no. I never knew Fred very well, Mrs. Weems admitted. I only saw him once, but I suppose we must have had a spiritual affinity. And this message he sent you? Fred kept saying over and over, Maud, are you there? I can't get through. I can't get through. I take it you never did get a message to you, Penny said dryly. No, after a while the lights went on again. Oh, Sandra was quite worn out. He said if I wished to come again, he would make another attempt to reach Fred. He believes we'll have a better contact next time. I'd save my money if I were you, Mrs. Weems. Then you think oh, Sandra is just another fraud? I certainly do. But how could he learn my name? And it was uncanny the way Fred called to me. Fred is a very common name, Penny pointed out. I imagine Osandra learned that you were Maud by hearing your friend address you. I don't remember that she called me Maud at any time, Miss Weems frowned. Now that I'm home, it does sound a little silly. I'd rather you not say anything to your father about it, Penny. Your secret is safe with me, Mrs. Weems. What shall I do with this roast? I'll look after everything now, Penny. Thank you for getting the dinner started. Penny kept her word and did not tell her father of Mrs. Weems' visit to Osandra's seance establishment, although it required stern discipline to keep from repeating the story. She had never known the housekeeper to do such a silly thing before. Mrs. Weems was not inclined to superstitious as a rule and took a sensible outlook on life. Oh, Sandra must be an unusually good faker, Penny decided. I wouldn't mind seeing him at work myself. However, the next day she forgot about the matter, and Mrs. Weems carefully avoided speaking of Melvin or Sandra. After breakfast, Penny walked to the marble doll shop. The showrooms had been cleaned, and Nellie herself was in better spirits than upon the previous day. I see you're open for business again, Penny said cheerfully. Did you decide not to sell to that old lady? I haven't made up my mind yet, Nellie answered. The police were here late yesterday. They are of the opinion I'll not be bothered again. Penny chatted with the girl a few minutes and then remarked casually, These are cute boxes you use for your dolls. Yes, said Nellie. I like them. A paper company made them up especially for me. I saw one of your boxes yesterday. It was delivered to an actress at the Rialto. Oh, a bright flash stained Nellie's cheeks. Nellie did send the doll, Penny thought quickly. Aloud, she said, it was the strangest thing. Someone gave Miss Harmon a queer creation, which for a lack of a better name, we called a witch doll. Right away, it occurred to me that the doll might have come from your shop. Nellie did not speak. There was a note with the doll, Penny went on for after a moment, a note saying that the doll might prove an inspiration for a dance. Miss Harmon liked the idea very much. You didn't send that doll by any chance? Nellie's eyes fell before Penny's steady gaze. I, I don't know, she stammered. Please don't ask me. Turning abruptly, she disappeared into the rear room of the doll shop. Doo-doo-doo-doo.